In this lecture, I plan to discuss the Old Kingdom, focusing primarily on everyone's favorite Egypt subject, the pyramids. I will cover the reasons for pyramids and the evolution of their form from a simple pit in the ground to soaring mountains of stone and why they took that form. I will also take a close look at everyone's favorite pyramid, the Great Pyramid of Khufu and its well-known enigmas, and I will dispel a few common misconceptions about that pyramid and pyramids in general. I will also talk about theories of how the pyramids were built, including a very interesting, if controversial one, that has recently been proposed and that seems to have a great deal of promise. And then a quick peek at some recent studies based on technology that hold the intriguing possibilities of some heretofore hidden cavities within the body of the Great Pyramid. So with so much interesting stuff to cover, let's get our hands dirty and explore the pyramids. All right, so far we have covered the earliest period of Egyptian history, early dynastic era, 3000 BC, and also last lecture, I talked about general principles of Egyptian painting and sculpture, which for the most part are going to remain constant throughout the rest of Egyptian history. What we're going to take a look at now are remains that come to us from the Old Kingdom period of time. So about 2700 BC to approximately 2150 BC. These of course are the pyramids, everyone's favorite subject probably when it comes to ancient Egypt. Now, one of the misconceptions that I would like to dispel about the pyramids uh, is that they weren't built throughout the entire span of Egyptian history. In fact, generally speaking, 2700 to 2150 is a span of time in, during which they were built. So that's 550 years, still a very long time, longer than the United States has been a country, right? However, when compared to 3000 years of time, uh, not that significant. But in any case, these are some of the re most remarkable structures ever built, not just in Egypt, but in the history of mankind. Now, a couple of other misconceptions I would like to dispel about the pyramids is what they were for and who built them. And of course, if you were to ask the man in the street what the pyramids were for, he'd say, well, the tombs of the pharaohs. That's partially correct, but as we will see, that's not entirely what the pyramid was. Also, asking that same man in the street uh, who built these pyramids, the response typically would be Hebrew slaves. Well, the, nothing could be further from the truth. For two reasons. First of all, these were not built by slaves, but by citizens of Egypt either voluntary workers or uh, professional gangs that were paid to work on these structures year-round. Gangs of workers that were supplemented undoubtedly during the, uh, the period of inundation, because remember most of Egyptian uh, workforce would be out of work during that three or four month period while the Nile was overflowing its banks. And so I, I can well imagine that during that four month period, Pharaoh was not just letting his, uh, the majority of, of his populace lie around uh, at leisure, but typically would be putting them to work on public projects, such as building these great monuments that were to serve him as uh, houses of eternity, which is the term that we use for them, or that they would have used for them as houses of eternity. So these weren't built by slaves. Uh, we know this from excavations that have been recently done in which workers' villages have been excavated uh, that contained hundreds of people that would have been uh, put to work on these uh, structures year-round for the most part. And like I say, probably supplemented with additional workforce that would be drawn from the general populace that were, during most of the year, farmers but during the inundation could not be farming, so had to be doing something else. 
Now, one might question, why would anyone want to work on these if they were just a farmer or uh, if they were not uh, well paid? Well, again, keep in mind that these are being built uh, in honor and to serve the Pharaoh. And for the ordinary Egyptian a citizen, who was the Pharaoh to him? Well, he was God on earth. So wouldn't uh, that be normal for him to spend uh, time necessary to put in his labor on building such projects? Now, the other aspect of that was that it was Hebrew slaves that built the pyramids. Well, again, no such, no such thing occurred. In other words, when you, think about, when you think about it, the Hebrews descended from Abraham, right? He was the father of the ultimately, of the 12 tribes of Israel. However, scholars today believe that Abraham, if he had been an actual individual, and there's some question about that, of course, among scholarly circles, historians, but nevertheless, if he had lived, it would have been around 2000 BC. Well, so these pyramids are not even being built any longer by the time Abraham is born. So there's no question that the Hebrews didn't lay a finger on these stones uh, in terms of uh, building them in the honor of the Pharaoh. So ordinary Egyptian workers are working on these, some of them paid as professional gangs, others probably as kind of semi volunteers, undoubtedly receiving a, a minimal wage in food, beer, and bread, and housing to do their work, more than likely. Now, as you look at this image, the thing that strikes the eye immediately, of course, are these so-called Great Pyramids that stand here uh, in the middle of the screen. However, notice that often in the distance there are other pyramids uh, because the, this area is kind of pyramid alley, so to speak. Many pyramids were built in this general area of the Giza Plateau, where these great pyramids are located. And then out in front, what many people just simply overlook, uh, are these smaller pyramids uh, built for queens of, uh, of the era. Now, I say smaller, but small, of course, is relative, because you look at this guy in the foreground, uh, on his camel here, and you can see how truly massive even these small ones are. In any case, let's take a look at uh, pyramids and uh, their purpose and how they came into being. Because obviously these, uh, these structures were not just conceived of overnight and then put up in order to honor the Pharaoh or to serve as his, as his tombs. In fact, uh, the funerary architecture doesn't even begin with pyramids, but with something much more humble. So I want to take a look at the evolution of the form and also an explanation or a suggestion as to why they even take this form. Because engineers tell us that pyramids, especially on this scale, are, are, are difficult structures to engineer. Because if all the, the rows of stones stacked on top of each other are not precisely laid and cut and designed, uh, the pyramid will begin to warp basically as it rises. So these are very difficult structures to engineer and to build. So the question would be why go to that effort? So these structures are not really tombs in the general sense. These are funerary architecture that was meant to protect the Pharaoh's body for eternity, as were all Egyptian tombs. So even though the pyramids themselves weren't necessarily a tomb, they certainly were there in order to protect the tomb, the burial chamber inside of which the Pharaoh's body was uh, preserved. So protect the Pharaoh's body for eternity so that they could, of course, have that body complete like we talked about earlier that was necessary for them to achieve immortality and eternal life in the afterlife. 
They were also meant to serve as his memorial. Anyone seeing these, of course, during his own lifetime or after his death would be reminded of what a great individual this Pharaoh was, this, this person was. And also meant to recall his godlike power, simply because no one uh, would be able to raise these monuments unless they had nearly a godlike power that they could wield within their society. But they really weren't tombs themselves. Okay, and I'll talk about that more in just a bit. So let's talk a little bit here next about how pyramids came to be. How did this shape evolve? Where did it come from? Uh, and what were the beginnings of funerary architecture back in their earliest days, the, the early dynastic period or even earlier? How did all this come to be? Well, one of the things that scholars believe that the pyramid did was to symbolize the pharaoh's relationship with a sun god, Re, or Ra. Now, Egyptians believed that uh, the pharaoh was the son of the sun god, a son of Ra, okay, Horus on earth, so to speak. And so these structures were intended to symbolize his relationship with the sun god. And this was brought about primarily through what is referred to as the Benben stone. Now, the Ben Ben stone is a very unusual artifact that was revered by the Egyptian people. What scholars believe that it was, was an iron meteorite that had fallen to earth sometime in the far distant mists of time as far as Egyptian memory went. So an, uh, the thing that was interesting about this meteorite, though, is that by the time it arrived on Earth, it had acquired a pyramidal shape, like this one here. Now, this is a meteorite that is located in a museum in Mexico City that is also an iron meteorite, and you can see that it has taken a pyramidal shape. So the idea is that this iron meteorite, as it travels through the atmosphere, melts, right? And the, the metal flows backward from the, from the front uh, to form this pyramid-type shape or triangular shape so that by the time it lands on Earth and cools, it has taken on a pyramid-type shape. Now, the Egyptians believe that this had at some point in the far distant past fallen from heaven as a gift from the gods. Some writings even suggest that the Egyptians believe that the bones of the gods were made from iron. So this is a divine, heavenly type of material. So it was highly revered, uh, venerated, in fact, at the city called, that the Greeks called Heliopolis, which means city of the sun, and that this was a gift from God and was kept there in a temple to be venerated. And so this meteorite, some argue, was the inspiration for the shape that ultimately became the pyramids. Now again, they didn't begin as a pyramid shape, but something much simpler. So another aspect of the Ben Ben stone is that it may have been a symbol of the primeval mound. Remember the primeval mound that rises from the seas of chaos uh, in the creation myth. And so it may have been symbolic of that primeval mound as well with its shape. Okay. Now, or it, some have suggested that it could have been a phallic symbol of Atum. Remember, Atum was the self-created god that first appeared on the uh, primeval mound and began the creation story. Uh, and so here we have an obelisk. And notice that the tops of these obelisks are capped with a pyramid. And so maybe there's an association there of some type as well. Generation, you see, uh, of life. But pyramids began as very simple forms in the prehistoric era, and then that evolved over hundreds of years of time. So the very first stage of the evolution of the pyramid begins with what is referred to as the earthen mound. Now, this doesn't relate. Don't confuse that with the primeval mound. The primeval mound is 
part of the story of creation, the earthen mound is the first stage of funerary architecture, of burials in Egyptian history. So the earthen mound. The tombs were originally simple pits in the sand like we see here from the British Museum. And then uh, when the individual died, the body was placed into that pit with a few possessions like we talked about in our discussion on mummification. And then the body was, uh, the, body, the burial was covered over with a mound of earth and sand, okay? So these evolved eventually into a very large earth and rock mounds like you see here. So this is a burial mound in, uh, from a very ancient Egypt. And these are quite large. Here's an individual squatting on one of these uh, to give you an idea of the scale. So these weren't simple, kind of nondescript little mounds of earth and rock. These were fairly monumentally uh, scaled because important individuals were buried beneath these. So here's my uh, recreation of one of these earthen mounds, and I'll remove the mound here to remind you that below the mound was that pit. The early simple pit at this point has evolved into a fairly elaborate collection of chambers cut out of the bedrock, but still below ground. And then the mound would have been placed over the top. Of course, they have to cover the top of this with uh, either planking of some type or uh, woven reed mats or bundles of mats or whatever uh, so that they could place the dirt over the top of that. But inside of these chambers uh, would be placed the, the body of the pharaoh along with his possessions uh, that were to be taken into the afterlife. So we begin here in the very earliest stage with an earthen mound. Now what I'd like you to note is the shape of it. Okay, which is fairly natural that it take on this type of shape, but has sloping sides and a fairly flat top. Okay, now keeping in mind the strength of tradition for Egypt, that tradition is going to be seen in the consistency of these shapes uh, as uh, the evolution of the, of the funerary architecture proceeds through the ages. So later, these simple earthen mounds are going to evolve into formal ashlar masonry structures. By ashlar masonry, I mean either cut stone or sun-dried brick. So we see here an example of what's called a mastaba. A mastaba is stage two of this evolution toward the true pyramid. So these, uh, the earthen mound, has evolved at some point into a formal structure that we today called a mastaba. And note again the consistency of the shape. It's now made of stone, or in some cases, some early cases, made of sun-dried mud brick, but it still features the sloping sides and the flat top. So here's my model of a typical mastaba with an individual standing there to give you an idea of the scale of the structure. And that person is standing at the opening to a chapel that is inside. So these were obviously intended to imitate those early burial mounds with the sloping sides and the flat top. Now what they had that the uh, burial mounds didn't have is an inner chapel. So let's do a cutaway view of our mastaba here to see what is inside. So we've got an inner chapel and a subterranean burial chamber. And again, the subterranean chamber where the burial would take place just like for the early earthen mounds, the burial took place not inside the mound, but under the mound. So we'll do our cutaway view here and you can see the burial chamber and uh, descending that vertical shaft, access shaft down to the burial chamber, well underground. So to identify the parts of it, we've got the chapel here where mourners or uh, worshipers would come to bring offerings like we saw in that painting of the nobleman's tomb. So that would be the chapel. 
And then also we see there a false door like we identified in that, uh, in that tomb. What we see here though that didn't exist in those tombs is what's called a surdab. This was an additional room off to the side, kind of closed off with limited or virtually no access to that small room off to the side, uh, the purpose of which was to contain what's called a Ka statue. So here we're looking through a hole uh, into that room. Okay? And so we see on the other side of the wall a Ka statue. Now this of course is made of stone. Uh, and was intended to serve as a reserve body, just in case the, the body of the pharaoh was somehow uh, destroyed, that the Ka statue could serve as a stand-in. Now, I don't know quite how that would work, uh, because obviously the statue is not the body, but nevertheless, as I've talked about before, you can't, uh, you can't apply logic to, to much of this thinking. Okay, so in addition, we've got that access shaft leading down to the burial chamber. And then in the burial chamber, we've got uh, the sarcophagus, a stone box, inside of which the coffin would eventually be placed, and then separating the chamber from that access shaft, a blocking stone, a very heavy, closely fit blocking stone. Now, the way that this would have been built originally is that the access shaft and the burial chamber would have been excavated first before the mastaba was built over the top of it. And so they would uh, undoubtedly build the, this, access, this vertical access shaft straight down, excavate the, the burial chamber out, place the sarcophagus in there, and have that all prepared for the time when the Pharaoh's body, when his coffin, uh, mummiform coffin, would be brought to the, this location and then put into the sarcophagus, the lid placed over the top of the sarcophagus, uh, and then uh, the, bear, the blocking stone moved into place. And then in order to help prevent grave robbing, they would then fill uh, the access shaft with rubble like you see here. So that would be completely filled with rubble so that once the burial had taken place, no one could descend any longer down into the burial chamber uh, with the intent to disturb or to loot uh, the treasures that were there. Okay, And then, of course, as you see at the top, they had a, an access uh, door up here, and that would be closed over as well with some stone in order to prevent grave robbing. Unfortunately, as you probably are aware, uh, none of those precautions ever worked successfully. Every grave ended up being robbed at some point in time. We're going to talk somewhat later about when that grave robbing took place. It might surprise you to learn, but we're going to talk about that in a, in a later lecture. Okay, so that's the mastaba, a formal piece of funerary architecture based on the tradition of the earthen mound. Now the next stage of this is going to come at the, uh, at the behest of a pharaoh by the name of King Zoser. Now, King Zoser, he demanded when, for his funerary architecture, he demanded a monumental version of those mastabas. And so he commissions his vizier, a fellow by the name of Imhotep, to construct it for him. Now Imhotep is an interesting character because we see his portrait here. Interesting character because uh, he was uh, the pharaoh's vizier, he was his uh, physician, he was his architect, he was his advisor, a far, apparently a fairly well-rounded uh, individual from ancient Egypt and ultimately acquired such fame and such repute that he was ultimately deified much later on because of his accomplishments. Now you might recognize the name Imhotep because that's the name of the priest of the mummy movies. So uh, a real name in this particular case, but of course Imhotep wasn't the, the evil character that uh, shows up in those uh, mummy movies. Anyway, so what uh, Imhotep does for King Zoser 
is our next stage of the evolution toward the true pyramid. And that is creating what's referred to as the stepped pyramid. And this occurs in 2611 BC. So even this structure goes through a series of modifications. So the very first stage is a monumental mastaba, as you can see here in my model. Now this is much, I don't have a, uh, a regular mastaba nearby to compare it with, but just take my word for it. This is much larger, uh, many times larger than a typical mastaba. Now at some point, uh, Zoser apparently wanted a few modifications uh, done to this. And so the next stage was to enlarge it, make an already large structure even bigger, and add more mastabas on top of it in descending order of size. So he adds three more mastabas, so to speak, on top of that large lower one, that large base mastaba. Well, Zoser, I can imagine Zoser coming out one day and taking a look at, at the construction site and saying, yeah, well, that's pretty nice, but couldn't you just make that a little bit bigger? And so Imhotep enlarges it again. So the fourth stage, he enlarges it again and adds three more mastabas on top of that in order to become what we call today the stepped pyramid. Okay, so this is a remarkable structure, early stone structure. Off to the side, uh, you can see the mortuary temple, which is no longer inside because the, this pyramid is solid stone. There's no, no chambers, no openings, nothing inside. And so the mortuary chapel, in keeping with tradition, had to have one, right, for offerings being brought in honor of the pharaoh. So now that stands alongside uh, the pyramid. And you will see uh, examples of true pyramids where that mortuary chapel will still be placed alongside of it in this tradition. So here is the actual stepped pyramid. It is the world's first monumental stone building. Now those of you that are familiar perhaps from uh, Art History One uh, survey course uh, and have studied the, the structures of the Mesopotamian River Valley might recognize this shape because it looks very much like a ziggurat from Mesopotamia. However, they aren't similar other than the fact that they've got these different levels in descending order of size. Ziggurat is made of clay brick. The stepped pyramid is made of stone, the world's first monumental stone building. Ziggurat is typically at most 100 feet high. The stepped pyramid was 200 feet high, in fact over 200 feet high. Again, the ziggurat is a temple platform. So the structure that you're seeing there, the levels, are just levels that were intended to raise the, the temple up on high. And the temple is what, the shrine is what you see here on top. The stepped pyramid was never intended to be a temple. It was a funerary structure, so funerary architecture. So even despite the, the similarities in shape, the, the two buildings have virtually nothing in common. And as far as uh, historians know, no cross-pollination of ideas here. So the stepped pyramid results not from an attempt to recreate a ziggurat on a monumental scale, but rather Imhotep's innovative ideas of taking a mastaba and stacking mastaba on top of mastaba in descending order of size in order to create this monumental symbol to Zoser's godlike power. So here's an aerial view of the site, and, be a, and you can see that uh, it consists not just of the stepped pyramid, and of course, as you look at both of these images, you can see how very badly weathered and worn and eroded the stone has become over the centuries. And you notice that the different tiers have uh, sand piled up here from sandstorms that blow frequently through the desert. But in, in addition to that, we've got this 
complex that surrounds the, uh, uh, the pyramid as well. And so Imhotep includes that also in the entire complex of the burial structure. So much of that, much of the building that you see here, uh, the structures that you see here is part of a medical college. But interestingly enough, this large plaza out in front, that large courtyard, was designed for what was referred to as the Heb Sed Festival. The Heb Sed Festival is a rather unique kind of uh, observance among the ancient Egyptians. I don't quite frankly know how strictly this was observed, this uh, ceremony was observed, but the Heb Sed Festival was to be held every 30 years of a pharaoh's reign. So after 30 years, in order to determine whether the pharaoh was still physically capable of ruling, he had to perform certain physical athletic uh, uh, events. And so after the first 30 years, he performed the Heb Sed Festival to prove that he was still physically capable of ruling. And then every three years after that. Okay, so it would involve such things as running and shooting, testing the pharaoh's physical ability to rule. Here's just another view of the stepped pyramid to give you an idea of the scale by looking at these people that are standing near the base of it. And also to see the, the very bad erosion that has occurred over the centuries here. It's in pretty bad shape. Uh, in fact, you would think that this would be an extremely stable structure, but it actually is in danger of, of some degree of collapse today, as you'll see in the next couple of images. But in any case, what I'd like you to look at here is just a scale of this structure. Now, the thing is made of small ashlar masonry bricks. So here's a photograph that I took on my trip to Egypt all those many years ago. And I was intrigued to see the side, the corner of the structure here, basically on the verge of collapse and being reinforced, held up by these spindly wooden props to begin with, but also rebuilding a portion of it here, uh, temporarily at least. And then these two fellows down here, these two workers down here in the foreground that are industriously working on these limestone blocks and recreating the wall, which would look like this when finished. Now, I like this comparison because this is the way that it looks today after millennia of weathering. And this is the way that it would have looked originally with be fine, beautifully cut, smooth stones. And the thing to note is that these stones are small enough that they could be carried by relatively easily by just a couple of guys. That's not going to be the case of later pyramids where the stones will be enormous in size, several tons, in fact, in size. Now, the last feature I want to show you about the stepped pyramid is that in keeping with that early earthen mound where the burial chamber is below the mound, below ground, and with the mastabas, where the burial chamber is below ground, some 40 feet below ground in some cases, the stepped pyramid also has its burial chamber below ground. Okay. In fact, it is, uh, here's, here's where the, the burial shaft, which would have been created first, of course, and then the pyramid built over the top of it, that is 140 feet deep, cut into solid bedrock. So you can imagine the amount of labor that went into uh, the, the excavating of that burial shaft. Fairly significant in terms of its uh, dimensions. I think it's like 20 or 30 feet on a side. So it's very uh, large and very deep. Now you visualize yourself as an Egyptian workman who is working on this, laboring probably for years and years at a time in order to excavate these things from uh, the solid bedrock. But that's not all. The um, sarcophagus was placed at the bottom of that burial shaft, 
and then that burial shaft was linked to the mortuary chapel through a, a diagonal access shaft like you see there where the the uh, sarcophagus could be brought I mean where the well yeah where the sarcophagus and later on the coffin could be brought down into the burial chamber but even goes beyond that because for whatever reason Zoser decided that he wanted an underground palace beneath uh, his burial monument. And so there is a, a, a rather extensive complex that might be considered a palace, so to speak, but a complex of passages and corridors that, that uh, snake around through the, uh, the bedrock at 140 feet deep. I mean, try to visualize the workmen that are working down there no natural light, probably not a lot of real breathable air with the dust in the air as uh, they're chipping away at the, at the uh, limestone in order to tunnel out these, these uh, corridors and so on. A remarkable, quite a remarkable achievement. Now, I can't think of any other pyramid that has this type of complex beneath it, even though they do have their burial chambers beneath the pyramid, but not this rather extensive and seemingly rather useless complex of corridors and passages and storage chambers and so on. So that is your third stage in the evolution of uh, toward the pyramid. And of course here you can see that you've got the pyramid shape and it really is just a question now of filling in the sides come up with a smooth pyramid type, uh, true pyramid type structure. So here's another view I wanted to show you with a scaffolding around uh, on the different levels. Again, the Egyptian government trying to uh, stabilize the structure to make sure that it doesn't collapse or isn't any further damaged over the, over the years. Now again, just a reminder, Imhotep was later deified for having built this uh, great uh, monument. Okay, so now at last we come to the last stage. This is stage four and results in the true pyramid, that is the pyramid with smooth sloping sides. The individual responsible for this is someone by the name of King Sneferu. I call him Mr. Pyramid because as you will see, he doesn't just build one pyramid, but he builds three of them. And it's going to be his efforts that will culminate in the final shape of the true pyramid. So this goes through several stages as well. So let's take a quick look at them here. So try number one is called the Medum Pyramid. Medum is just the name of the town in Egypt uh, where this pyramid is uh, located. So here you can see the core structure of the Medum Pyramid is a stepped pyramid, like we saw with the stepped pyramid. Okay, so this pyramid began with a stepped inner core, and then smooth sides were applied on the outside. Now what you're seeing here distributed around the base of the pyramid is the debris of that uh, smooth outer skin. It has all collapsed at some point, and that's what we've got here. You can, if you look carefully, you can see elements of walls and uh, some, some stonework here, and then a lot of rubble. So let's take a look at what happened to the Medum Pyramid. So it began as a seven-layered stepped pyramid, just like King Zoser's, right? Okay. Then it too went through a second stage in which, in which it was an enlarged and made an eight layer structure. Then a tr the sides were simply filled in to create this smooth sided pyramid. Now, why did Sneferu have his workers do that, add that additional element? There is no records that describe or explain why he did it, but again, I refer back to the Ben Ben stone that is pyramidal shaped and as a gift from the gods related to the gods. So perhaps 
This uh, makes a closer relationship to the gods through its shape. So, it, however, suffered collapse, as we can see here. And you can see from a distance the, the huge pile of rubble that has surrounded it here. Uh, and some uh, mathematician, some engineer mathematician, actually calculated that the debris at the base of it is equal to the volume of what would have been the casing stone. So it was indeed the result of collapse, even though it's kind of hard to visualize that here. So that's a bunch of rubble and then just dirt and crap all, all around it in addition has built over up over the, the millennia. So the cause for this collapse has been evaluated and basically in this diagram we can see quickly the cause. So the inner portion here, here's the, the earliest part of the, the stepped structure, then the enlarged version. And so those early, the, that early masonry, that early stonework, and this is all built of stone, of course, that early stonework was, was placed on a foundation of solid bedrock. Okay? And then as you, you see in this diagram, the subsequent stonework was placed at an angle in order to increase the stability of the structure. Then we see that Sneferu decides that he wants to have a nice smooth structure instead of an old-fashioned step structure. He wants a smooth outside skin. And so as an afterthought, that later casing is put into place. But notice that its blocks are horizontally placed, not as stable as those angled ones. And then in addition, at the base, it's sitting on its own foundation that itself is sitting on desert sand. Now at some point, for whatever reason, that base shifted down or this, the, the foundation settled somewhat because it was on sand instead of bedrock. And that caused, as you can see here in our diagram, that caused the casing stone to begin to separate from that solid core. That increased the compressive load on all of this lower masonry here as this began to separate, causing it to buckle outward catastrophically and the whole entire casing came tumbling down, resulting in this catastrophic end to this experiment. Okay, well, Sneferu doesn't give up. He tries a second time. This one results in what is called the Bent Pyramid. Called that, obviously, because the profile changes angle uh, at some point. So it starts out at a 54 degree angle, which is about the angle of a true pyramid. But uh, at this point, the engineers kind of chickened out, basically, and lowered the angle to make it uh, more stable. Now, some scholars believe that this may have been a consequence of, uh, of damages that they saw occurring, beginning to occur at the Medum Pyramid, and so they, they changed their design. We don't know for sure. You can see the, uh, a large portion of this still retains its exterior skin. Now, in this view, you can see a closer uh, view of it, uh, where you see the smooth skin here, and then the part that has fallen away or been removed, you see the rubble, kind of rubble stacked stone inside. This is just a close view of the angle of the skin of the pyramid. And you can see how very smoothly these stones have been cut into an angle that uh, gives you a nice smooth angle here, closely fit together without any kind of mortars, just all held in place by, by friction and weight. But you see how very beautifully carved is the stone for the, for the skin. Now the entire pyramid and all pyramids, even, even the stepped pyramid, I showed you the stone that would have been typical of its original look. So here we see uh, the entire pyramids would have been covered with this type of outer skin. Very fine limestone. Well, after that abortive attempt with the bent pyramid, Sneferu tries a third and final time, and at last, 
arrives at what we call today the Red Pyramid uh, because of the kind of reddish cast to the stone. But now we have finally a true uh, pyramid shape with a smoothly sloping sides. So this too would have started out with a stepped pyramid core and then the outer uh, skin added later to, to fill in the sides and create a nice smooth slope. Here's a view from uh, Google Earth showing the rather beautiful design of this pyramid. It too is missing all of its exterior stone here. So we're just looking at the, the rough stone uh, of, the, of the core of the, of the base structure of the, of the pyramid. So they finally got it right. And from this point onward, the, the secret to building pyramids, whatever that secret was, however they did it, because we don't know for sure, but the, from this time onward, they were able to build ever more impressive and grander pyramids with each passing generation. The difference between this one and later pyramids is that uh, this one is at that lower, safer 43 degree angle, whereas the later pyramids, I believe, are at 52 degrees. Okay, so how were these built? That is the question, right? How did they build these things? So here we're looking at a closer view of our pyramid and you can see the huge blocks of stone of which the pyramid is comprised. Now, obviously all the outer smooth outer skin has been removed and all we see here is the rough blocks of that inner portion. Another view of the pyramid gives us an idea, a bit of an idea of the scale of these pyramids. Now, this happens to be the Great Pyramid, and so it's one of the biggest, but I subscribe to the theory put forth by one scholar who said that you can read about Egypt all you want. You can watch as many, I'm paraphrasing him, you can watch as many videos as you want, as many movies, see as many photographs as you like. But until you actually go to Egypt and stand at the foot of these great structures, you'll never understand the nature of, of Egypt and its accomplishments. And so these are the kinds of things that really need to be experienced in person. And I would encourage you to do so if you ever get the opportunity, travel to Egypt and experience for yourself what, these, what all of these things are like. I can tell you from my experience that it, is, it would be an experience never to be forgotten uh, because it makes all the more clear how incredibly ingenious, industrious, and persistent the Egyptian was in being able to create these gigantic mountains of stone. So we're quite a ways removed from those simple little earthen mounds through the mastaba, to the stepped pyramid, to the true pyramid, finally here at last. So, well, we, we don't know the secret to building these uh, structures. There's been volumes and volumes and volumes written about how the Egyptians may have built these things, but frankly, we just don't really know, okay? We can look at the structures and analyze them and try to figure out in a logical way how it could have been done, but we don't know the method that they used to, to, to pile these stones on top of each other. We do know how they were quarried and brought to the site, but we don't know how they were put into place. Because remember, it had to be done on a perfectly level surface, and then every rank of stone had to be perfectly aligned or the or the pyramid would become dangerously unstable like the Medum pyramid or it would begin to twist and warp as the structure rose into the sky into the air so the engineering had to be phenomenal on these gigantic structures but how they did it we don't know they never left a shred of information about how they built these things. Now, Herodotus, that Greek historian, does give us a few hints as he understood it, 
But you have to keep in mind that when Herodotus visited here, these pyramids were already a couple of thousand years old. And so there's no way that anyone living could have told him how they were built themselves. So that would have been a mystery to the Egyptians themselves. So whatever Herodotus says has to be taken with a certain grain of salt. Anyway, these are built of limestone. These are built on the Giza Plateau, which is today, which is just across the Nile River, just west of present-day Cairo. Now keep in mind, Cairo wasn't there in those days. Well, Cairo is a city that was built in the medieval age by Arab caliphs of the, that ruled Egypt at that time. And so these are the limestone is quarried from two different locations. One location nearby on the Giza Plateau itself for the poorer quality of stone. And that's what would be used in, in these kinds of structure here. And then the fine limestone that would serve as uh, the, the outer skin was quarried and ferried from across the Nile. So here's an image uh, from Google Earth of that, uh, uh, of that quarry. So here's the Giza Plateau here. This is Cairo today, the Nile River there, and the Tura limestone quarry over here. So the limestone would be quarried from here, then transported by sledge and by a boat over to the building site. No doubt they would have drugged the limestone blocks from the quarry on sledges over to the river and then loaded up on barges and probably a combination of overland travel and canal travel would have been used to bring the blocks to the building site. And so the, they did construct large canals that would lead from the river to the building site so that uh, the uh, stone could be ferried as close as possible to the building site. I'll show you a little video uh, later that gives an idea, a little animation that gives you an idea of how that was done. So these, uh, near the building site there would have been a harbor. I've placed a temple on a little island there in that harbor. But this is where boats would, would have brought uh, in the stone that could then be ferried up to the building site. So as I mentioned earlier, professional gangs worked year-round on these uh, pyramids. Okay? Not slaves, but professional gangs, highly skilled individuals. Uh, with volunteers probably augmenting the workforce during the period of inundation. So here's a, here, uh, I want to take a look here at a, at a couple of theories as to how these pyramids were built, how the blocks of stone were moved in, into place. So the most traditional and popularly held theory is the so-called ramp theory, in which gangs of men would have pulled these large blocks of stone up an earthen ramp to the top of the pyramid, or they would be manhandled into place. So I have our little animation here showing these guys uh, working away at the moving blocks on these sledges. And then uh, another example of uh, gangs of men pulling blocks up the, up the slope, up the ramp. It's estimated about 50 men per two-ton block of stone in order to drag a stone. And it would have been dragged on wooden sleds, uh, perhaps on moistened soil like we see here in this diagram and an actual wooden sled that has survived the ages of time here. Uh, and so we can see the type of sled that would have been used. And you can see it in this image depicting gangs of Egyptian workmen uh, dragging this giant statue along. And notice that in the front of the sled, you've got a guy that's pouring water onto the, apparently water, maybe oil, who knows exactly, but moistening the soil so that the ru sled runners would move more smoothly along the, the sand. Okay? And then, of course, you've got the overseer standing up on the lap and making sure everybody is moving along fine, and then his servant bringing him some uh, cups of water. 
Anyway, so here you see these gangs of men that would have been necessary for pulling these very large uh, weights like uh, these statues or these two-ton blocks of stone. The trouble is, is it's one thing to pull a large heavy weight like that on flat ground. And remember, no, no beasts of burden in those days. They didn't have oxen to help them pull. It was all manpower. Uh, and no wheeled vehicles of any kind as well. And they're also not using log rollers, as you can see in that illustration. There's no log logs beneath the runners. They're just dragging that across the sand. The trouble with dragging these blocks of stone up an earthen ramp onto the pyramid is that you have to have a certain gradual slope or it's not possible to do. That slope has to be less than 10 degrees. If it gets more acute than that, then it's quite frankly impossible to drag a two-ton block of stone up that ramp. So this theory simply is not feasible. Here we see my little model of the Great Pyramid, which stands 400 feet tall, and makes the point that perhaps at the lower levels of construction, a ramp could have been used because the angle could be kept rather shallow. But as the pyramid rose, the angle of the ramp would rise as well, it would increase as well. Uh, and in order to keep that angle at a reasonable 10 degrees or less, it, the ramp would have had to, to extend out into the desert over a mile. Okay, so here we see Bob Breyer, the Egyptologist that I spoke about earlier in regards to mummification. Here he is standing in the desert looking off toward the Great Pyramid, that 400 foot tall structure, and he's a mile away from it. So it gives you an idea of how long that ramp would have had to have been. And some mathematicians would have estimated that such a ramp would have contained more material than the pyramid itself. Well, I suppose it would have still have been feasible, it would have been possible to create a ramp that big. But the argument against it is that once you have completed the pyramid, then what do you do with the material, which is more than in the, than in the pyramid itself? What would you have done with that material? Had to be some massive dumps of uh, material somewhere on the Giza Plateau, and scholars have never been able to find such dumps. And so this ramp theory is no longer tenable. So here's another modified version of, this, of the ramp theory called the spiral ramp theory. It was popular some uh, for a while, uh, a couple of decades ago. So in this case, you're using a ramp, but instead of having it extend directly off the pyramid at 90 degrees, it wraps around the pyramid in this fashion. So as the pyramid rises, so does the ramp as it wraps around, and it's an earthen ramp, as it wraps around the pyramid to achieve its goal. And perhaps that is a possibility. The idea behind that one is that you don't have that extended axial ramp and having to deal with the, the angles and the length and the, and the amount of, of material. And also, the idea is that once you have completed the pyramid at the top, then you would dismantle the ramp. And as you dismantled it, you would put the skin in place as you went down. So that's a possibility although it runs into some real problems once, you, uh, once the ramp uh, reaches the, the top of the pyramid where you've got very little room and uh, would be hard to, for, to, to hold a ramp onto the side of the pyramid there. Also, the other issue is that the corners. In other words, you've got a gang of men pulling a sled up the ramp uh, at some distance in front of the stone and when they come to the corner where the ramp turns the corner around the pyramid, where do the men go, right? Uh, they can't keep pulling straight out in front of them because they'd fall off the edge of the ramp. But they can't go around the corner because you can't pull the stone around an angle. Uh, and so uh, the, the spiral ramp problem kind of falls, falls apart under that type of investigation. 
So a uh, more recent theory that is still controversial but does hold some possibility, and that's called the inside ramp theory. So this was propo proposed uh, 10 years ago or so by a Frenchman by the name of Jean-Pierre Houdin, who was actually an architect. He wasn't an Egyptologist, but he was fascinated with the problem of building pyramids, especially the Great Pyramid. And so after years of study and speculation, he came up with a very interesting theory that he calls the inside ramp theory. And this is uh, this little video here, it's about a five minute video, shows us kind of what that theory was. So you got the workers village off to the side, you have the transport canals leading up to the building site. We fly over the support services here into the uh, harbor where the stone is being delivered on barges. And then uh, that stone is being offloaded onto these uh, docks and ramps and then dragged up to the building site. You can see in the distance there uh, the Sphinx, an outcropping of stone that will later become the Sphinx. Then you go up that uh, roadway and you see a quarry for low quality limestone to the left. And here they're digging out that low quality stone here on the Giza Plateau. The good stuff comes from across the river on the at, at Tura, of course. And then here they're building a ramp out of that low quality stone. And then on the other side, as that body of the pyramid rises, then the high quality stone is being brought up by this other ramp and then levered into place, cut and levered into place by workmen. To, to provide the skin to that lower quality core. So these are the interior blocks here, and some of it can be almost like rubble, as I'll show you in the photograph in a bit. And then the interior portion of this, of the Great Pyramid, is being built as the pyramid rises. And so the interior ramp is that as the pyramid rises, that ramp rises along with it, but wrapping around the pyramid, but on the inside, rather than the outside. So the evidence for this is that here you can see a smooth exterior stone, like that Tura limestone. And then this is the quality of the stone inside the pyramid. You can see it's nothing like this stone here that's all been carefully cut and fit. This is rather like rubble, in a sense. And this is the way the interior of pyramids looks. The outside is like that. Okay, so you got this rough inner stone. Now this is Udon's diagram of that inner ramp. So as the pyramid rises, the ramp is constructed on the inside and rises along with the pyramid, enabling it to maintain its shallow angle as it wraps up to the top of the pyramid. Now, some years ago, a French group did a density scan of the Great Pyramid. And what you see here, the, the purple areas are areas of low density. And so they did this scan and it kind of surprised them as to what they, came, what they saw. And that is some dense areas of green and the purple indicates low density. They didn't know what it meant. And so they just set this aside and, and uh, never considered it further until one of those researchers encountered Udan's theory and remembered that scan, pulled the scan out, and it's rather remarkable how similar the two are. So Udan is saying that this is an inner corridor spiraling up on the inside, inside these walls, uh, and this density scan seems to kind of support that. And then also, Udan says that when you come to the corners here, you have to have a special kind of mechanism. You'd leave the corners open with a special turning mechanism that would allow the stone blocks to be pivoted and then dragged up to the next corner and pivoted and so on. And one of the, one of the little noticed uh, features of the Great Pyramid is that notch right up there, which perhaps is a turning notch. 
And this is the way that it looks. So Bob Breyer, who happens to agree with Udan, he got permission to climb up the side of the pyramid one year to, to investigate this notch, and he was rather intrigued to find what it consisted of. Okay. The thing that's interesting is that beyond these, beyond these uh, blocks here, there is an open cavity in there. Whether that would have been uh, possible for having this turning mechanism or not, no one knows, and many Egyptologists dis dismiss this as not being very logical, but it's an intriguing possibility. And so then also as further evidence is that there is, not too far away, there's a sun temple of Niasure, who is a, um, a pharaoh of a later era. And here is the base of that sun temple. The base of it looks kind of rather like a mastaba kind of structure. And then it has an inner ramp. And so here's the doorway opening leading into it. And then, so it comes in through here and here's the ramp. There's the outer wall. And here's the ramp on the inside and it wraps around uh, that structure. And so inner ramps were a possibility and leaves a rather intriguing question as to whether Udin is right in some way. Be nice to be able to uh, somehow get into the pyramid and see if you could find such a interior corridor in order to uh, either support his uh, his theory or to uh, dismiss it. Now there is a one other kind of intriguing element here and that is at one point some time ago, uh, it was observed that a fox was ran across that opening right there. Uh, and so the question would be, how'd that fox get in there if there is no opening uh, for it to travel through? Anyway, don't know the facts on that, but it is kind of an interesting thing to maybe investigate a little bit. Now, the last thing that I want to mention here before I wrap up this lecture. I'll continue this uh, in my next lecture where I, where I will take a, a close look at the Great Pyramid itself, but this is getting long enough as it is, and so I think I'll break this uh, section into two lectures. And so last thing I want to mention here is a project that was put into place back in 2017 and 18 in which a Japanese company using a very advanced kind of technology called muography uh, in which muons are measured and muons I don't know exactly what they are but they're tiny little particles cosmic particles that can penetrate through solid uh, structures and so there's a way of measuring those with plates and so this uh, company put a bunch of uh, these muon detecting plates down here in this chamber here and was able to measure uh, the muons as they passed through the pyramid. And what they reported on two separate occasions were voids that seemed to be evident inside the Great Pyramid. So this diagram here gives us an idea of uh, what they mean by that. So they named them the small void and the big void. So one seems to be a small corridor behind the gabled stones. And I'll show you this next uh, lecture, the gabled stones of the entrance. There seems to be a small corridor there. In other words, there seems to be a, a, an empty space there, a void. Okay, They can't observe it visually, but through the this muon detection, they detected a what seems to be a small corridor there. And then the other one is above, this is called the Grand Gallery, and we'll look at that in greater detail uh, in my next lecture. But this one is above the Grand Gallery, about the same size as the gallery, and kind of paralleling it uh, within the body of the pyramid. Now both of these remain to be further examined and monography is not precise enough to give us exact details and dimensions. It just indicates a void. And so uh, recent reports have indicated that the 
Egyptian government has invited this company to come back and do further investigations and studies on the pyramid to see if they can resolve this issue more completely. So again, remains a very intriguing element of the Great Pyramid at least, and may offer some clues as to how it was built uh, in a certain, uh, to a certain degree at least. Meanwhile, all of this remains to be further uh, revealed at some time in the future, you know, when the aliens come down from outer space and tell us how they helped the Egyptians to, to accomplish all of this. Uh, and there are a plethora of internet sites that try to, uh, to promote such ideas because the Egyptians themselves could never have moved blocks of stone of this size and with such, placed them with such precision uh, and so on back in those early times. On the other hand, I have confidence in the ancient Egyptians. They w it must be recognized that they were stone workers without parallel in the ancient world. And so they discovered some way of being able to do all of this. It'll just be nice if we can ever figure out exactly how. Now there is one uh, joke that I wanted to finish this with, and that is years ago I saw in Archaeology Magazine a little cartoon that <laughs> purported to reveal the way that the pyramids had been built. And so you've got the, the desert floor, the Giza Plateau down below. You've got an elevation where two supervisors, foremen, are overlooking the construction site. And what they've done is to dig a great giant pyramid-shaped pit into the desert floor. And then they're just sliding the blocks down the sides into position. And then one, one supervisor turns to the other one and says, that's the easy part. The hard part is flipping it over. <laughs>